Hey everyone, happy Advent and an early Merry Christmas to you. If you didn't already know, your church council and staff are in regular conversation about when and how we might resume in-person celebrations. When COVID rates were on the decline, we'd begun thinking through some kind of limited outdoor Christmas Eve services on our fountain's patio. But as of today, COVID has not left members of the fountains untouched, and we are seeing the highest ever rates of infections, hospitalizations, and deaths from the pandemic across the country. And when Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are masked up to receive the wise men, and Santa is confined to a plexiglass box, it's time to take notice. So we've decided as a church council to keep one another safe by celebrating Christmas Eve online instead of in person. We hope you'll plan to take some time on December 24th or 25th to join us virtually on YouTube or Facebook. Plus, we'll be gathering together live via Zoom right after the premiere of our Christmas Eve service to share some eggnog and wish one another well in person. As our Christmas Eve services are traditionally among our most well-attended celebrations of the year, I hope you'll also invite friends and neighbors to join us. Watch your e-streams for times and links, both for yourself and to forward to family, friends, and neighbors. I know some people might point to other churches that are meeting in person and ask why we aren't meeting in person. First off, let me remind you that we aren't other churches. Secondly, let me share with you what I shared with someone who's not a member of the Fountains, but who wanted me to join her in condemning mask mandates and the government's effort to undermine Christianity. Really? I told her as a pastor and as a faith community, our first priorities are to do no harm and care for people in the here and now. The last thing we want to do is organize church-sponsored activities that could lead directly to someone's death. And I suspect Jesus wouldn't be happy about it either. I understand that for some denominations, there's a culture of having to worship or God will somehow not love them anymore. That's not Methodist or any kind of divinity I recognize. There are also some denominations that see in-person worship as a kind of defiant expression of spiritual strength and proof of their love of Jesus. But Jesus is not some sacred talisman that will ward off COVID, as some churches have sadly experienced firsthand. What I do know is that many of us are craving the in-person time that enriches our lives and deepens our faith. But right now, along with hospital visits, in-person holiday gatherings, and, and sitting on Santa's lap, our commitment to keeping one another safe and healthy outweighs those much longed for conventions. In the meantime, I wanna express my gratitude for the many creative ways you have all continued to reach out to the community at large to encourage and support our neighbors and one another. From your generous support of Extended Hands Food Bank, the families at the Wesley Center and the kids of Sidewalk Sunday School to our interfaith efforts benefiting the rural Navajo Nation and building a tiny house in Chinle, you have made putting love first real in the world. Thank you for your continued participation as part of the Fountains family. I, with you, Look forward to being together in person as soon as it's safe and advisable to do so. Until then, be smart, stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you online. Join me as we get in the spirit. In anticipation, we gather. With expectation, we wait. We gather to hear the good news. May our ears and hearts be opened. In this spirit, we begin. 
Let our celebration bring new life. We search for lasting hope to help us face each day, to give us reason to pursue a different way. In Christ we see a way to go through high and low and set us free. Sometimes the hope we want is difficult to find. It falls to us to foster it in heart and mind. In Christ we know a path to tread through peace and dread and help us grow. When others seem to break, when hope seems at an end, we may be able to give hope just as a friend. In Christ we share a call to be in ministry to love and care. Hope brings us back to life in hope we can proceed. God of the future calls to us but we but heed in Christ we how God can reign in our domain, make all things new. This Christmas brings new hope for justice, peace, goodwill. This Advent time may bring with it a secret thrill. With Jesus can be reality with each new dawn. Let's affirm the Fountain's mission together. As followers of Jesus, we put love first. As followers of Jesus, we light this candle of love to remind us of our guiding principle, a compassion and empathy that is not limited to this season, but expressed in our everyday lives throughout the year. May we know we are loved, share the love we know, and in all things, put love first. Amen.
source of grace, you inspired the prophets to preach repentance. The one we call your beloved child sought to reconcile us to you and to each other. We confess that we have often failed to live up to our full potential. We have not done what is best for ourselves or others. We have rebelled against the difficult task of loving our enemies. We have cherished our resentments and not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us. May we have the grace to hear the gospel anew and open our hearts. We long to be a healed and healing people. May we be renewed so that we might greet with joy our celebration of the nativity. We offer this time of quiet openness. We bring our whole selves in the name of the one who taught his first disciples to pray the prayer that we now sing together.
Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because God's given Jesus Christ the Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because God's given Jesus Christ the Son. Give thanks. When you arrive at a mainline seminary, one of the first things you learn is the importance of context. So to get started, you study the history of the ancient Near East. And wow, what I didn't know. Ancient stories of the Jewish people aren't dry as dust history. They're critical to understanding the Bible. They're rich and complex dramas with intrigues and double crosses and power plays that make today's political intrigue seem tame. And considering how long a history it is, it really helps put the ego of our 250 year old toddler country into perspective. So knowing the historic context not only helps the Bible make more sense, it's an exercise in humility. Micah comes from a turbulent time in the history of the Jews who in the biblical version have already cracked up into two different kingdoms after Solomon's death. Lots of fear and unrest in the southern kingdom, Judah, and internal rebellions in the northern kingdom, Israel. Why all the unrest and internal conflict? Speaking for God, Micah makes it pretty clear. The oppression of the weak by the upper classes. It seems that the powerful and wealthy elites, including politicians and priests, are the problem. Micah warns them that unless things change, there will be a judgment. Good thing nothing like that would ever happen today. Huh? Well, enter God's instrument of judgment, the then current superpower of the region, Assyria. You may have seen some of the remnants of Assyria's artistic and religious reputation in any number of museums around the world displaying statues of the Lamassu, protective deities whose job it was to intimidate evil spirits. Okay, meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, the king of Judah, King Hezekiah, was playing a dangerous game. He was already a puppet king of the Assyrians, but Egyptian influence over Jewish culture and politics was strong. A recently discovered clay seal of Hezekiah's clearly shows a blending of cultures of Judaism, the Hebrew text, Assyria, the winged sun, and Egypt, the Ankh symbols. So several things happen in succession. Stay with me here. The Assyrian king Sargon II was killed in a battle, shattering the myth of Assyrian invincibility. Hezekiah then, probably encouraged by his Egyptian allies, renounced his Assyrian allegiance, which was a profoundly bad move politically. Sargon's son, Sennacherib, was not to be messed with. His forces descended with a vengeance and not only wiped out Hezekiah's Egyptian allies, but crushed the Jews. When Sennacherib annihilated the northern kingdom, the ten tribes based there were scattered once and for all. Eventually, Judah was also destroyed and Jerusalem survived only by paying huge sums of tribute tax. Then comes our passage today. Plop in the middle of Micah's Oracles of Judgment a prediction of salvation for a remnant of the people, a promise of a new ruler who, like David before, would come from Bethlehem, 
the smallest, good-for-nothing little nowhere that anyone could possibly think of. Early Christian writers, most famously the authors of Matthew and Luke, applied this prediction to Jesus. Let's hear Micah's original text. Our words of wisdom today are from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5a. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. When I was in seminary, I had the chance to travel to Israel and the West Bank over Christmas break. Overall, it was a life-changing experience, not the least of which was because of our visit to Bethlehem on Christmas Eve. At the bus station in Jerusalem, we had to go through metal detectors and pat-downs before we could even get, a, get in line for a bus ticket. And once we were on the bus, IDF soldiers boarded to serve as guards. One of these Israeli teenagers with an Uzi over his shoulder asked me to move out of my seat so he could put one of those big box field radios in a place where they could stick the antenna out of the window. Seeing my discomfort with his Uzi bouncing in my face, the young man smiled and using his very best English said to me, commando bus. Great, not helping. After the half hour drive to Bethlehem, and this was before the Berlin style walls that segregate Jews from Arabs were put in place, we were deposited at yet another checkpoint with more metal detectors and more pat downs. And once through, we found ourselves in Bethlehem Square outside the Church of the Nativity. Huge crowds were bustled together. Choirs from around the world tried to outsing one another with Christmas carols, and the whole square was surrounded with jeeps mounted with 50 caliber machine guns. Think Rat Patrol. Ironically, only the elite with special VIP tickets were actually allowed into the church, so it didn't take long for my traveling companions and I to get the heck out of town. It seems Bethlehem was no place to spend Christmas Eve. After taking a cab back to our dorm in Talpiot, we decided to head out on foot. We were already on the far southern edge of Jerusalem, so it didn't take long for us to emerge out into undeveloped fields. Making our way off of the now dirt road onto a rise, we found that what we thought was a hill was actually a decaying pillbox along the walls of the original armistice line of 1949. We clambered up on top and we sat down and there we were. The lights of Jerusalem behind us and the glow of Bethlehem in front of us. Midnight under the stars on Christmas Eve. There wasn't a lot to say. We all sat with our own quiet thoughts about the place we sat and what it's meant to history and to our own spiritual journeys. But the contrast of that hectic scene in Bethlehem with our abandoned concrete bunker made for a bit of spiritual whiplash, but it also made for me an unforgettable moment of out of timeness. Not a Christmas goes by without me thinking about that experience wasn't especially holy or mystical, but
boat. It was one of those moments in life that is almost hyper real, where every breath, every sur everything surrounding me was richer, deeper, and somehow felt more connected. I think what I was experiencing was something I didn't have a name for until years later, but has been pointed out for centuries by Celtic Christians who believed that heaven is not somewhere far away, but exists right alongside us, like another dimension, but separated by a veil. In most circumstances, that veil is more concrete block than gossamer thin, but there are moments and places when the space between heaven and earth is especially thin. So we almost get a glimmer of the divine. Another place that is famous for its spiritual vibe is the Isle of Iona off the west coast of Scotland. Its 13th century abbey is on the site of the 6th century monastery founded by St. Columba who brought Christianity to Scotland and where the Celtic cross was first created. For centuries, countless pilgrims have made their way to Iona for renewal and to get in touch with a sense of this something more. But I've come to be less and less satisfied by this idea of a veil that separates earth and heaven, like earth is something bad or unholy. Creation is the only place we're ever really going to encounter the divine, isn't it? After all, didn't Elizabeth Barrett Browning write, Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. Along those same lines, Trappist monk Thomas Merton once wrote that thin places are way more prevalent than the ancient Celts believed, but we, we just don't see them. Paraphrased a bit, Merton wrote, life is simple. We're living in a world that is absolutely transparent and the divine is shining through it all the time. If we abandon ourselves to the more and forget ourselves, we see it sometimes. The only thing is that we don't let ourselves see it. We miss those glimpses of the kingdom of God breaking in on earth, which is ironic because the fact that Jesus taught us to pray that we might see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Even in the midst of the very real threat of foreign invasion and their disillusion as a people, the prophet Micah called the people of Judah to look beyond their fears and know that the divine was not far away, but neither was it to be found in an expected place. Mind you, very few, if any of the people who heard Micah's prophecies would experience anything close to redemption or restoration. There was nothing but grief and doom on the horizon for a number of generations. But Micah was laying the groundwork for people to be ready to embrace something other than the status quo. Remember, the Jews had already split into two disagreeable factions already. They hated and mistrusted one another. And that inability to see their fates as inextricably linked to one another and to the least of those among them was the guarantee of their doom. <laughs> Sound familiar? Now, Micah is basically saying it, it's too late to avoid the consequences, but there's hope. Just don't look to chariots and armies for the solution. You've seen that walls separating us are not the answer. You've seen that grasping for your own security at the expense of others is not the answer. The future belongs to one who takes a posture of peace where security is gained in coming together as one people, despite our differences. 
Micah was harking back to the legend of David, who for all his shortcomings, people saw as a king that united all the tribes into one. So let's look to Bethlehem again, he says. Humble and obscure Bethlehem. Maybe there. Maybe there. You can see why both Matthew and Luke jumped on that line of thinking as a prediction of Jesus' coming. But while I'm convinced that Micah was in absolutely no way predicting Jesus, it was the gospel writers who made it look that way, Micah was on to something that we still need to hear. It's in the most unexpected places, the most pedestrian of places, the most everyday places that we encounter the divine. The way we look at it during the Christmas season is exactly what Micah was saying. We say, look, the birth of a child is a symbol of hope for the future. It doesn't have to be a holy child, just any child. Try and tell a new parent that you're unimpressed with their new baby because you doubt that she'll amount to anything. Look, we don't have to go anywhere. Bethlehem, Iona, or the maternity ward. Paraphrasing Rabbi Heschel, being awake is something to aspire to every day, despite being in the midst of the ordinary rush of life. He wrote, Normal consciousness is a state of stupor in which the awareness of the real and responsiveness to the spirit are reduced. The mystics endeavor to awake from that drowsiness and apathy and to regain the state of wakefulness for their enchanted souls. In the midst of all the preparations for Christmas, we can be caught up with the same traditions and obligations, most of them self-imposed, that require all our attention. And then we miss the fact that Christmas really calls us to consider a thin place. It's not really a place at all but a way of living every day. In popular spiritual culture, the buzzword for this phenomena is called mindfulness, which is helpful, but not the end all and be all. Swami Beyondananda, the alter ego of comedian Steve Behrman says, I studied with a guru who said that if I wanted to achieve mindfulness, I needed to release all my thoughts and focus on the center of myself. I am now thoughtless and self-centered. <laughs> so keeping in mind that even something as helpful as striving for mindfulness can be overdone, it's good to keep some practical strategies in mind. I found that Wendell Berry's sarcastic little poem, How to Be a Poet, gives some great advice about not just being a poet, but responding to life a little more mindfully. First, sit down in silence, then breathe with unconditional breath, the unconditioned air. Shun electric wire. Communicate slowly. Live a three-dimensional life. Stay away from screens. Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. In the words of Professor John Kabat-Zinn, the little things, the little moments, they aren't little. So be still, slow down, breathe unconditioned air, set things electrical aside, Embrace the sacred places in your life. Be mindful. So, here we are. I'm here, and you're, well, where, wherever you are, and wherever we are, I'm pretty sure that it's a couple of thousand years shy of the gravitas a place like either Bethlehem or Iona has earned but we don't need to go anywhere to be mindful of the proximity of the divine right here, 
right now is good enough. Even in the continuing uncertainty of a global pandemic and our own national political morass, we can strive to tease out what life is all about by encouraging one another to be more mindful, to embrace those opportunities to be, as Rabbi Heschel suggests, genuinely awake, despite the fear, despite the setbacks, despite the fog and struggle of everyday living. May we breathe with unconditional breath. And remember, there are no unsacred places or unsacred times or unsacred people, but all can be a catalyst to awake our enchanted souls and open ourselves to the call that is on our lives to be followers of Jesus. Wake up, embrace the little things, savor the little moments, because they aren't little. Be well. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting. words of blessing. Seek the child. We will follow the light of hope's guiding star. Find the child. We will listen to the words of the heavenly host. Serve the child. 
we will offer as gifts the best that we have. God be with us. Peace be with us. Amen. Oh.